We're going to uh, try to change the focus a bit. Um, and I, I'm going to start by asking my second question, and then we'll see whether we can get into um, some other people who haven't asked their question yet. The second one is uh, is one about strategic intervention. How do you how do you uh, change things? Um, Jack, I have puzzled about this for a long time. As Derrida and you have both emphasized, binaries don't work in as much as they inevitably give priority to the one side at the expense of the other. Derrida and you have insisted on the need to first reverse the priority, but then Derrida goes on to insist on the need for replacement, another way to proceed, a third thing of sorts. However, in your radical theology, you consistently and insistently contrast the weakness of God versus the omnipotence of God, weak theology and strong theology, perhaps in certainty, and even at times transcendence and eminence, time and eternity. Why, I don't follow. Granted, binaries do have striking rhetorical effect, which you use to full advantage in your dazzling rhetoric. But it means that you end up with the power of powerlessness such that God's power is entirely powerless. Indeed, that is the way you describe the insistence of the event, your key idea. And it leads you to declare God contingent, not eternal. As I have insisted before and want to once more, why not talk of the vulnerability of God, which is actually strong and powerful, because it dared and dares to take the risk of creation? Along similar lines for us as humans, it is in owning our vulnerability that we are strong rather than weak. Anyway. Uh, yeah, that's good. And it's also a, uh, an issue that I've, I, I probably need to make more clear. In, in just going back to deconstruction as a theory of meaning, um, well, it maintains that... that I guess in the simplest terms, it maintains that the meaning of words is the way words function contextually, right? So there would never be a context in which you couldn't make something true false or make something false true. You could always just simply recontextualize it. So if I said to you, what's your name? And, your name? and you said, my name is George. I could construct this context in which that's wrong. Namely, if this were a play, and the part you were asked to play was that of Harry, and I said, you watch your name, and if you said George, you say, all right, let's try it again. <laughs> I mean, this is a rehearsal. Don't you understand the question? Um, so words don't have absolute senses. They have relative, they, they belong to uh, what, what, what Derrida calls economies or strategies. And so the notion of weakness or the notion of strength would never be, weakness would never be absolutely good. It would never be, it's not the case that when I talk about the weakness of God, that I mean weakness in every possible sense in every possible context is bad and strength in every possible context is, is good or, 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 or is good. So uh, the, the, what, what I'm engaged in here, as, the, as Jim points out, is, a, is what Derrida calls strategic reversal. So I'm um, um, take, uh, I'm exploiting the notion of the power of powerlessness or of a weak force, which I think is in fact what describes the nonviolence of God in uh, the New Testament, and in particularly in the first chapter of First Corinthians, but not the second, where the second chapter he just simply uh, undoes all the good that he does in the first chapter. I think. Um, and so I'm saying, look, forgiveness is a weak force. It's a, it's a genuine force, but it's not the force of violence. It's the force of, it's a disarming force. To forgive someone when they expected a war is utterly disarming. Right? Now, if that's the reason you're doing it, of course, then it's just simply a strategy and you, it's back in an economy again. It's not a gift. But the force of forgiveness, the force of mercy, the force of love is a real force, but it's a nonviolent force. And so when I speak of the power of powerlessness, I mean that. I mean, it's, uh, it's a genuine. There's a Gandhi, you know, is a great example of the power of powerlessness, the power of, of nonviolent resistance. Um, 
so I mean that. Um, secondly, um, I am divesting the notion of metaphysical omnipotence of its force. I, that is to say, I take that to be a theological mistake, that there is an omnipotent being who does things. To, to that God, the proper theological and religious response, the, uh, Tillich says, is um, atheism. I'm, I'm an absolutely unequivocal Tillichian when it comes to the existence of a being who is omnipotent and who does things, or when he fails to, we are puzzled or we blame him and then we get into the um, the arguments of theodicy. But I'm saying that's not, and that's a, a, a fantastic notion of God's power. That's not the power of God. The power of God is the power of insistence, the power of solicitation, of uh, the, the, our, our dream, our prayer, our love, our desire beyond desire for, uh, for justice, for peace, for forgiveness, hospitality, etc., that the na- name of God is not the is not the name of a of a powerful force. It's the name of uh, an, an invitation, and it does not valorize weakness to the exclusion of strength. It's it's the weakness of God is in in the second sense where I'm saying he's, it, it's not like he's a super being, but a call, and the weak force of a call calls for. Strength calls for strength on our part. So one very good way is uh, to think about it is Benjamin's notion of the messianic age, where he says, "When we have been expected by the dead, we are the ones the dead have been waiting for. We are the messianic age." We're the ones expected to act. Not we. Don't, don't wait for the Messiah to come save you. We are the Messianic age. And so, what I mean by the weakness of God is a theory of radical responsibility. Now, that's sort of a Zizekian moment on my part. Right? You know, where I'm saying, uh, and, and both Zizek and I are being Hegelians at that point. That the... the whether you think, if you think like Hegel does for metaphysical reasons, or if you think like I do for phenomenological reasons, the, 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 the name of God achieves uh, reality in the community, in the, in the flesh, in, in existence, in, in, in our existence, in our response. It is, we are, as Levinas says, answering a call that we never heard. Uh, and it's our response, our... Uh, Commitment, our strength, our resoluteness, our uh, re- the re- the reality of our of human response, which gives, which fills up what is lacking in the body of Christ, which fills up what is lacking in the body of God, as Salim Fegg says. So it's not an attempt to valorize uh, one side or simply re- of, a, of a opposition or to or to uh, simply reverse the, the opposition. The reversal strategic and the purpose is not weakness, not, not anemia, but uh, uh, transformation. I'll ask you about the, the event, uh, specifically a lot of yeah. what we've read from you about the event in the context of theology and talking about God. Um, we started out uh, early on in the semester with your, your truth book, and it's more of a popular presentation. But, but in that, you talk about truth and the events, um, first through phenomenology and, and hermeneutics, and you also talk about language games and um, paradigm shifts. And one thing that wasn't completely clear to me when you, you name specific um, moments that you talk about as events. Uh, is how we should distinguish between event with a small e and event with a capital E, the event that is to come, the event that, that may never come. Uh, is there a distinction there when you say an event is really a paradigm shift? Is that 
more how we should think about uh, the event with the little e, and there's another, a different uh, event, capital E, that is something not completely other, but different from, from all those other events yeah. that you can name in history. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it exactly like that, and, and, and I don't think you'll ever find a capital E event in there because I always avoid caps or for. Uh, I save caps for the bad guys. Um, it's a decapitation thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, we we now, in retrospect, can see in the past that there were events. You know, the very definition of the event is you can't see it coming. And and you might very well not know that it happened when it happened. So Rosa Parks had not the slightest idea that she just produced an event that day. Um, and you see this, uh, one of my favorite examples of this sort of thing is teaching. I mean, you, if, if you find jobs, and I hope you do, um, your experience as a teacher will be every once in a while meeting somebody who said to you, will come up to you and say, I want to thank you for what you said that day in class. And you're thinking, what class? Who is this? What is he talking about? <laughs> and you will have said something that altered someone's, that set off a chain of events, you know, that's changed things in that person's life. I don't know, you don't even remember the course that it was. So you, not, not only will events happen that you don't realize are happening when they happen, but you may not, never know they've happened, and you may not even remember them when someone tells you that they do. So e event, e events, events have this uh, interruptive power that we can't, uh, can't control, and, and um, some, sometimes can, can't even remember that we were, were part of. Um, the the two what you're calling the second event that uh, but when but but a lot of times when they do happen we can name them and they get names and we remember them and we honor them and we have anniversaries for them. Um, the other thing that you're talking about you're, that you're tempted uh, by the serpent to capitalize is uh, I wouldn't do I wouldn't capitalize it I would say there is the very structure of the to come which is always already in place. And it is, um, a, as long as we are temporal beings, the, the to come is the uh, yeah, unavoidable uh, horizon of, of the future. Uh, from which, and from the unforeseeability of which, the event comes. And... Uh, so the, and that insinuates itself even into the most foreseeable events. You know, so you can foresee all sorts of things, and then it's the unforeseeability of the to come, which changes all your plans, and everything is different you know, because of, of a phone call or because of something that happens. Uh, so there are the events that occur, and then there's the structure of the to come, which ensures that events will always come, be coming. The structure of the to come is structural. Is that, is that getting at what you mean? Yeah, it's very helpful. Um, it's not like I think that there's something called the event yeah. that we're waiting for. I, I think part of what I'm curious about is how that relates to, and you said something that's already today, to the conversation about the possible and the impossible, it seems that the to come can uh, shatter what, what we understand to be possible. Right, it does. Uh, but all of the things that we look back upon, they, they fit in a certain sense with what we, we call the possible now. So how how you understand that sort of orientation, you can look back and say, look, Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. That, that doesn't make sense. Of course not. But if to, to think of a kind of, we can talk about us being the Messiah, and we can also say, well, maybe there's some other Messiah that, that comes. There's another way of, of, of thinking about that, uh, different kind of messianic perspective. And if, if that were to break into the world, 
could shatter everything that, that we take to be possible. But I, I guess I'm curious, it seems like there's a sense in which structurally that kind of messiah could never come because it, once something has broken into it, it has to conform with um, all the categories you've been talking about already. So I, I wonder, if, is there a way that the event is impossible, a, a certain kind of to come of the event is always going to be um, impossible, or the possibility is closed off? Are you are you saying it in, in this way, uh, perhaps, TJ? Um, <laughs> when you say the impossible is to come, but it never comes, because if it did come, the whole thing would be over. So that's that's kind of what I I, I hear. Yeah, I, yeah, you'd either have a pleroma in which everything was fulfilled. Um, I mean, it, put it in the concrete, uh, or, the, or make it more specific. The to come is always the to come of something. Right? It's the to come of justice, or the to come of hospitality, or forgiveness, or let's say democracy. There, there it is, the most constant example is the democracy to come. Uh, so it's the ever recurring uh, call of what democracy promises. The, the, come, the to come is the very structure of the promise. Now promises have to be relative to some horizon of expectation. The, and the event is the promise of something that we can't see coming, some desire beyond desire that will transfigure ways in ways that we didn't imagine. To transfigure things in a way that we didn't imagine. For better or for worse. Uh, I mean, that's the structural risk of time. It's temporality. It's time. We don't know what's coming. And that will always be in place, uh, no matter what comes. You know, well, there'll be new expectations. The, you know, it's it's Augustine's restless heart without the rest of the sentence. It's the very course Augustine has identified the very nature of our desire which I that one of my disagreements with Lacan uh, with Zizek is Lacan uh, I think Lacan's got desire wrong I think that he thinks it's this desire of plenitude and a lost plenitude and I think there never was any plenitude to lose and what I desire is not uh, a lost plenitude Desire is the desire of, of what is promised by the, the things that are around us. What awakens us, that, that things are not stable and compact and self-present and self-identical. They, they give off sparks. And so the word democracy, something is being promised in that word for Derrida that no existing democracy fulfills. And that will always be true. Even if at some point we don't even, we're not even using the word democracy anymore. It's just what I also think is one of the reasons why I, I think God, the name of God, the name of God is contingent because it may be that the way we, whoever we are, you know, in some distant future, express our desire. We won't be talking about God anymore. We'll be talking about it in some other way. Uh, but the very structure of promise, when the things that are around us uh, evoke, have, have specters of the past from which they've come, have been handed down to us by the dead, and they tremble with promise and possibility. And they're never simply present. And uh, we live in the distance between the memory and the promise. And that will always be true no matter what occurs. That's why I would never say there is something called the capital event, E. It's the very structure of the promise. And the only way you can stop that would be with Neoplatonic eternity, which I think is a mistake. It's not even scriptural, because the scriptures weren't talking about that. The scriptures are talking about everlasting bodily life, not eternity. Uh, when you were just saying rose between kind of memory and promise, 
Um, it struck me in your book on truth. Truth is always kind of associated with a futural event, right? So it's always sort of erupting and. Yeah. There's something, I mean, that's an expansion, right? So it's not that that doesn't account for, like you say, prepositional truth and whatnot, but it's trying to get at something else, you know, which I think is helpful. Um, but one thing I find myself sort of wondering about that is do you kind of, does it seem like you, in the weakness of God, you emphasize memory as an important. You know, that's one thing, as you refer to Benjamin, that gives us energy, right? The truth of what's being claimed from behind is as important as the truth that's claimed from in front. Yeah. Um, but somewhere it seemed that that got lost a little bit in the truth book. And I thought more about, too, your emphasis on phenomenological truth, which is maybe more present-oriented, you know, the disclosing power of what's simply around. Um, so maybe you could just speak a little bit more to, you know, linking truth to the event. What does that do to the rest of the kinds of truth that you've identified in other places? You mean the, the truth of the past? Of the, yeah, or, or the kind of disclosive truth of whatever phenomenon <coughs> view, or even a certain kind of mysticism, you know, like sometimes truth, so truth is eruptive, I think that's right, but sometimes truth is sort of a, a deepening or a, or a connection or a reconnection with certain things, you know, um, so it, some, sometimes it is sort of warming and edifying um, as opposed to always being, you know, kind of putting you on edge. Yeah, sometimes it fulfills our, f f temporarily fulfills our desire. Yeah. We are, as temporal beings, our desires never would be full. The only real peace is in the grave, and I'd rather be restless than dead. Um, well, uh, it, 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 that's interesting. I didn't, didn't quite realize it. If, if, if in the truth book I, I, I put more emphasis on the future than on mourning and the, what Benjamin calls our hope in the past, which is an interesting way to put it, not hope for the future, but hope in the past, I shouldn't have. You know, I, I wasn't. Uh, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have done that if that's what I did. Uh, it's, it's very important in Derrida to keep the two. It's something I think he ultimately is getting out of both Husserl and the phenomenology of internal time consciousness, and Heidegger and Heidegger's notion of the re, re, the repetition or repeating or recovering of a tradition. Uh, he calls it choosing our our heritage. Um, so th that's of the utmost importance. I, I also, as I said yesterday, don't mean to displace or I mean to displace, but not eliminate propositional truth. So I think propositional truth is particularly troublesome when you get into religion. You know that what what we're getting in uh, uh, our religious beliefs is a series of propositions to pick out facts of the matter in the world, and then when you stray from those propositions, you lose your job. Right, that's just a really terrible way to think about uh, religious truth, or or it's, it's a good way to think about the strictly logical truth, and that, that's okay. Uh, so when you said, but but what about other kinds of truth, like phenomenological truth? Well, that is phenomenological truth. What I'm calling the truth of the event is phenomenological truth. I mean, it, it actually goes back to an essay called, that Heidegger wrote called "On the Essence of Truth." in which he says, well, look, look, there's propositional truth, but then there's something m more fundamental or radical or prior to propositional truth, which is the truth of dis what he calls disclosure. And then he goes on to say well, that disclosure is also, there's closure in disclosure. You know, there's something concealed in what's unconcealed. And, I'm, I'm, and, and that's the phenomenological essence of truth as opposed to propositional truth. Propositions occur within a horizon that's already been disclosed. But phenomenological, the deeper phenomenological sense of truth is disclosing those horizons to begin with and how they shift and change and can be altered. Um, do you think that the only two options are like propositional literal truth or metaphorical truth? Because that seems to be like, if I remember correctly, well, what we were saying before the break about this, the resurrection of Lazarus or the resurrection of Jesus himself. Um, you know, it's either literally true or it's metaphorically true. Like, are those, in fact, the only two options available to us? 
Certainly not in, in terms of truth, and, and certainly not in terms of the reading of the scriptures, because scriptures have, let them have as many read, readings as possible, so long as all of them are true, Augustine said. Right. So they, they, have, they have allegorical meaning, they have moral meaning, they have ethical meaning, they can be turned, uh, they can be ways of uh, putting us on the spot and making us shape up so that we come under their accusatory. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the consideration of their historical, Character. There's a ca- this consideration of their literary character. I mean, there's multiple levels in which yeah. multiple kinds of truth. Um, and in the truth book, I'm 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 arguing just that that they're I'm I'm breaking, trying to break out of the preoccupation of moder- modernism with propositionality, mm-hmm. and open up other kinds of truth. It's one of the reasons I like Hegel because Hegel is all about truth, but he's saying that truth comes in many uh, ways. Mm-hmm. So there's the truth of the work of art, the true religious truth, and the truth of philosophy. So I went, and then there's other kinds of truth besides that. There's the truth of a, of a true love, or true commitment, or fidelity. And the only difference I have with Hegel, let me just say this, the only difference I have with Hegel is the way he hierarchizes them and subordinates everything to philosophical truth, mm-hmm. and cons- which is a higher kind of conceptuality. I, I like what Hegel says about the multiplicity of ways of being true, but without the Hegelian hierarchy. But then there could be other ways of knowing, too. Sure. So faith knowing. Sure. Uh, sure. Way. It's It's <laughs> the faith-reason distinction that postmodern is one of the distinctions that postmodernity invades, <coughs> and Heidegger does it quite uh, adeptly in *Being in Time* when he introduces the notion of seeing as. So that all seeing is seeing as. Now, what is seeing as? That's not that's not faith, and it's not just reason. You know, it's it's neither. So there's a hermeneutical cast that we put on things in order to let them be seen. Right? We don't just stare at stuff. Um, and there's a very and then if you read someone like when you get to it in the insistence of God, Bruno Latour, you see the enormous faith that uh, scientists have in their theories against all the evidence. When they first propose them, all the evidence is for the existing theory. And their uh, Pasteur, he, his, he gives an extended example of Pasteur. But people thought Pasteur was nuts. You know, they thought he was talking about these invisible microbes that, you know, that are all over our bodies. They think the guy needs therapy. And he just had to keep at it and keep on keeping on. And, and he had a deep, resolute faith in his theory, in science. So the faith-reason distinction is an artifact, it's not an artifact of the Enlightenment, but it is the exaggeration and exacerbation of it into an opposition is an artifact of the Enlightenment. And so I want, I want to... Elena, do you have a it. question? Yeah, yeah. Very uh, good. Um, <clears throat> I was very intrigued by your chapter on forgiven time in Witness of God. Um, you distinguish between, well, you say that re- um, reconciliation is very different from forgiveness. Uh, reconciliation is more of an, as an economy, a business-like economy of exchange, while forgiveness, um, forgiving the unforgivable unconditionally is an event. It's very different. Um, in doing that, the person who forgives changes in a way the past. There's a discontinuity that comes out. While the offender, um, the offender's repentance, the offender's confession that might happen or not happen, that is that person's business. That's his business. And he also need to, in a way, not just forget the past, but keep it here, remember it, so that the person does not do the same thing again. Now, I was wondering if it's not possible to think of reconciliation after forgiveness in another kind of way where there's another f- form of exchange that's not just business-like but different and I was wondering whether that can be connected to the 
offender's experience of a, a, a confession and repentance and sharing that with the person who forgives. Not as a condition for forgiveness, but after unconditional forgiveness. And if I can just contextualize it for a moment, um, I'm from South Africa and I saw there with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission how people forgive, absolutely, real, unconditional forgiveness. But then you will have the offenders and they would say, I confess to my God. I don't confess to people. That's my, that's my business. And in that way, reconciliation state exactly that, an economy of exchange, giving as little as possible to gain as much as you can. But on the other hand, I've seen how people who have been forgiven come and share their confession, share their repentance with the person they're wrong. And I, I think there may be a different kind of event happening there because you open yourself, there's a vulnerability, there's an acknowledgement of humanity. There's something else happening there. And I think it may be connected to an alternative creation where you freely give, you want to give, and to ask the other person, and there's a space to ask how to do that. And that's where you, there's a humanity that comes through and that forms a continuity, in a way, with the past, but to change it. How would you respond to that? I love it. Yeah? Uh, but, right. I, mean, no, I think that I did not mean to imply that, that, that anything that you just said is not true. I, I mean, first of all, this of course is Derrida talking about uh, the peace and reconciliation, uh, uh, very, the very process in South Africa that you're talking about. And what he's saying is this. Uh, Forgiveness, in my language, forgiveness is what insists, reconciliation is what exists. It's what comes to be in the, in the real order. And he's saying, it, it is worth our while to think the meaning of the concept of forgiveness, just the pure, the pure concept of forgiveness. And he says, when you do that, it's worth our while to do that. Something like a little mustard seed or a little leaven, you know, uh, in the in, in a larger reality. That the, the, the pure concept of forgiveness is the leaven in the dough here. Uh, to understand what it is and what it is is impossible. Right? It is this utter unconditional forgiving. That's the concept. That's the that's what insists. That's what solicits us. And then our job is to let that the purity of that concept uh, plant it like a seed. Let it let it be like the leaven in the dough. Let it uh, reopen the world in new ways, uh, in such a way that reconciliation, even if it is still some kind of economy is now a wider, broader, more expansive, more generous, more open-ended thing than it would have been otherwise in a straight exchange. It's like what Levinas says about peace. He says a lot of peace is just, political peace is just an agreement not to wage war with one another. And um, so it would do us well would pay would there be some uh, value in thinking about what peace really is <laughs> and so I think Derrida is saying look think about what forgiveness really is and then let that uh, disturb and interrupt and, 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 and fertilize the reality of reconciliation so that the result now it is also true it's interesting this what it is interesting about this is that Derrida is actually t his analysis of forgiveness is from the point of view of, of the giver of forgiveness. You're introducing the other point of view, and that's exactly missing from his analysis. But it seems to me you're, you've got the right complementary analysis from the point of view of the one who has offended. I think it's important that to create a space where both can hear each other, also to recognize the nature of systemic injustice, because it's very difficult to, to do it from one side. And to recognize that also kind of keep it, keep it going. It's not just 
the offender that need to keep in mind, I mustn't do this again. It's this how you do, this is how you don't do it again. You know? This is the way. Or well, this might be a way, and we can explore it and be wakeful together. So yeah. that's my sense. Yeah. yeah, and that's why it's not identical with forgetting. Um, which is also why I went into that big long chapter with Peter Damien where he, he had an idea of forgiveness so radical that God actually changed the past which meant nobody did the thing to begin with because God went back and changed it so that he undid what people do now that's a crazy metaphysical hypothesis that's probably that's probably <laughs> logically impossible although maybe not because, I mean, some of this stuff that, the, that they're doing in quantum physics indicates that it might possibly be... Um, That's right. It might possibly be a way to um, see back, to, to expand time in such a way that you could go back, in principle go back, just in nanoseconds, but you could go back. But that's uh, beyond my uh, ken. This is just... Um, in continuation of with that, wouldn't you, so you know the fruits, you know, you have the shrapnel and damage, doesn't that kind of prove that something has happened? And so, you know, you have a well, child, if you were able to change child, the, he it, had an affair, it, you know, like God going back in time and making it impossible, well, then he'd have to eliminate the child's support. Yes, right. And that's, that's not what it, happened, We just changed so. the past. Could it be that, Damien says, could it be that Rome was not founded even though Rome was founded? Could, could it be that God would make it to be that Rome was not founded even though Rome was founded? Then God could make it to be that that child was not born and that there wouldn't be the, the, the scraps, the after effects wouldn't be there. So the paradoxes of the, the logic of uh, the alter, altering the past. Uh, which is the stuff of uh, a lot of TV shows. But that's that's something else again. Yes? Uh, two of your recent books that we've had opportunity to review say you should come out as a kind of theologian. And we heard that you've written another book recently. Is that on that same trajectory, or are you working on other writing projects? Could you share with us a little bit of, of what you're thinking well, about well, the, the book that is I'm doing, there's a book that's coming out from Fortress, about which we have a debate uh, in terms of its title. The, the idea is that this would not be an academic book. And uh, so the, w they, they put an editor, an editorial hound on me to, uh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a hound dog sniffing at everything that sounds too academic in that text. And the very first thing was he didn't get past the first page. He thought the, <laughs> he thought the title was too academic. But... Um, the title right now is, um, like this discussion I was having with Jim, The Cosmos and the Rose. The Cosmos in this in, uh, sort of Nietzschean portrait. And the Rose being the mystical Rose, which is without Y in Meister Eckhart. And then the subtitle is, what is it? Nihilism, Mysticism, and Hope in the Postmodern World. Now, he thinks that subtitle, he thinks the first title is too, uh, what, does it, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and he thinks the subtitle, which explains what the hell it means, is too academic. Uh, but it's an attempt to sort of lay out uh, this question very much with your question in mind about does this preach? How can it preach? Can you, what, what does it have to do with real live religious traditions? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the sort of progressive element uh, in real life religious traditions, uh, which is trying to shake loose from authoritarianism and literalism and ca get to what I call the event, or what Derrida calls the event. But put it in, in so the pastor could use it. You know. um, so it's not meant to be a... a it's not written for the American Academy of Religion crowd. That's now. I'm, in the next few months, I'm going to be having a terrific fight with this guy about giving. And I, I had the same one with the Truth Book. The Truth Book was written for. It's supposed to be written for the people who hopped the tube in London 
uh, it's for sale on stands in the London Tube. And there's a book to read, put in your pocketbook or in your briefcase and read back and forth to work. So it has to be on that level of accessibility. And it's a good thing my editor was in London because I would have killed her if I could have got my hands over it. You know, she, I would but she was good. She knew what the, she was right. You know, practically every single time I disagree with her, she was right and I was wrong. And she should say, "You can't say that. Nobody knows what that means." And then every once in a while she'd say, "Say something funny," <laughs> 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 and like that. So it's difficult to write like that, but. That's what I do try to do that. But I do it now in my retirement. I think if I tried to do it when I was at Syracuse, they would have been scandalized. Um, the next book I'm writing is a book about... Um, I think that it's going to turn out to be a book about uh, spooks and magic and miracles and... Uh, mutability and transformations and transubstantiations and what I call the aleatory. And I'm going to have a chapter, the first chapter of which is in this book called It Spooks. <laughs> if you do, if, honestly, go on Amazon. If you got your iPhone with you right now, go in there, with John D. Caputo, It Spooks, and up will come a book called It Spooks. And the first essay is an essay on the spectrality of God, in which I, I sort of rehearse, again, for a, a wider audience, the, what I mean by the insistence of God. Second chapter is going to be on Hermes, the magician, the god of magic, tricksters, thievery, commerce, transportation, and hermeneutics. Very interesting God. On the day he's born, Hermes steals Apollo's sheep, turns himself into a wisp of air and zips back into the cradle and turns himself back into a newborn. And Apollo, who is pretty smart, tracks him down, <laughs> accuses him of stealing his sheep. And Hermes says, what, me? I'm a little baby. All I care about is my mother's milk. I didn't steal your sheep. And so he's also a, a skillful liar. He's the patron of lying and deception and tricks and magic and all kinds of stuff. Ultimately, I think he's a poet. He's the god of the poets. And the next chapter has to do with uh, Yeshua bar Yosef, the magician and uh, exorcist, otherwise known as Jesus. And I put the Jesus in dialogue with Greek philosophy. No, in dialogue with the Greeks. But, but enough of Greek philosophy. Forget the philosophy. How about putting him in dialogue, not with Plato, and then we get Platonism, or even Aristotle, which is much better result, but Hermes. Uh, and then I talk about uh, the next chapter, uh, social transformation, how to, how to make magic work, how to perform miracles in uh, the cruel, mean world that we live in right now. So it's a book, uh, it's, it's again going to be this, my, this will be my spiel, it'll be the same line but worked out somewhat differently in terms of uh, so wondrous works, the wondrous works of God. So, so the, in uh, the insistence of God, you, you have uh, sums down to magic. Yeah. Now you're going to have some sums up. I want to rethink magic and say, look, there is magic, which is, uh, you know, Elmer, Elmer Gantry, you know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's deception. But what's the event that's taking place in magic? What's the what's this what's the phenomenological event there? Very good, very good. And it's we call it the wondrous works. The word magic and the word the word magic appears in the New Testament, but it doesn't mean magic. It means a Persian wise man. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's there are people who write about Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus the the magician, 
this book called Jesus the Magician. There's a lot of a lot of work done by the historical Jesus people that have gone back and re-examined the exorcist healer stuff stories. Most of the historical Jesus people just simply dismiss them. And in the last thirty years, particularly under the impulse of people like Geza Vermesh and uh, others, people who are stressing the Jewishness of Jesus. They said, you're crazy. You can't do that. That's a basic phenomenon of first century Aramaic uh, prophets. They were healers and they were exorcists. If Jesus wasn't, weren't a healer and an exorcist, nobody would pay the least bit of attention to him. He, was, he had a silver tongue and he was a healer and he was an exorcist. And if he weren't, you would have never heard of him. And he, But on the other hand, if you think he was, then you also have to think that... Uh, uh, Hanina Bar somebody or other was also the son of God and so were two or three other quite well known uh, healers and exorcists so this is the the reason to think that Jesus was a healer and an exorcist is that there were several of them and they were uh, all quite good at what they did okay so what were they doing and what is that uh, mean in, 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 as I'm always interested in phenomenological terms what does that mean and it's our hope in the impossible it's our desire beyond desire it's our it's the promise of life um, and it's our hope in the event so, but I want to approach it that way because he was you know when I that that way I retold the story of the of, of the healing of Lazarus, raising of Lazarus, I think he did things like that. He, I think he was somebody who walked into a room and he just filled the room with his presence. And nobody was the same after that. And I think that he, he could, that a lot of these people would distinguish healing and curing. He, you know, he didn't shrink tumors, but he could get you through the worst nightmares. And, uh, which is a good he, distinction. Yeah, and he was, I mean, a lot like, a, I don't know, we talked about this uh, yesterday, there's a lot of doctors who are absolute brilliant doctors, but they're bastards as people, you know, they, they can't heal, you know, they cure, and it's the nurses most of the time that are the healers, you know, the doctors are just often just too busy and full of themselves to, to heal anybody. Healing takes time. Healing means holding somebody's hand and talking to them. So Jesus, the, Jesus, the, it doesn't say he, Jesus cured. It says he heals. And so uh, I, I think that's the relevant distinction with that. And and exorcism, exorcism is a lot easier to understand because there's just a, I mean, there's a, Dom, Dominic Crossan has an interesting uh, anthropological study in which he says. Uh, he shows that the disastrous results of dealing with someone in a uh, what we call a primitive society or an early, or early uh, indigenous society, uh, trying to deal with a problem, a psychological problem they're having with drugs. Uh, no, trying to use drugs to deal with a psycho problem, psychological problem they're having. You're much more effective if you let the local shaman in and let let him talk to this person and you get much better results. You, know, and you, you got studies showing that, right? You've got empirical studies that demonstrate that in, in societies where you still have uh, uh, a, 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 a shaman, those people are effective. I mean, they don't shrink tumors, but they are effective with an awful lot of things. So there was... And... and Jesus was the kind of would have been the kind of person who could do that. Now he wasn't alone. There were several back in the first century and before that. And so, what is that? You know, and what's going on in there? And that's that's well, that's the event. Right? That's the event. That's the hope against hope. It's impossible. So that's the next thing I'm working on. I'm look, I'm looking for a name for it. Um, I, what I I, I I got a I got a neologism. There's a debate about um, whether to call Jesus a magician. 
And Geza Vermash, who was a really good historian, says you can't call him a magician. It's anachronistic because the word magi meant a uh, wise man. It didn't mean a magician. And uh, so he says you could call him uh, a, a charismatic. But, and that would be a New Testament word, and whereas magic is not. So I said, well, how about charismatic? Yeah. It's got the... So you don't lose the word magic. You know, it's got, the word magic's got shock value. Uh, but you give it this, the New Testament. Or you recognize the New Testament uh, setting. Charismatic. So I'm thinking of calling the book Charismatic. Your editor you, will say. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter what I call the book. They'll, they'll call it what they want. Um, that's what I'm doing. So I'm rethinking spooks, magic, trickster. And Hermes is really an interesting character. When you examine Hermes historically, it turns out that the crap he was giving Apollo, Apollo was the god of the uh, aristocrats. And Hermes was the god of the craftsmen. Because he's also the god of craftsmen. He's the patron saint of uh, artisans. He's clever. He's a bricoleur. You know, he can make do anything. He 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 uh, he makes the first uh, flute. He makes the first uh, uh, um, um, what is it? Something else. But he's a, he's a god. He's a craftsman. He's handy, and he can make things out of other things. And he's a magician, so he can make things out. He can do magic with his hands. Really, really can in, in, in the story. And um, He's the god of the working class, right? And the, uh, Plato, you look at what Plato says about Hermes or Aristotle, they say he's a fraud, he's a jerk, he's got no, he's got, he's an unworthy divinity. He does not belong in the pantheon. He's on well, Mount Olympus. He's, he's just a rogue. And he's a little bit like Yeshua, right? He's on the side of the... <laughs> The, the people, the common people. And he works magic among them, and the people on the upper end don't like him. So the very first thing he does is steal Apollo's sheep. <laughs> so the thing called the, the Homeric Hymn to Hermes. Go look it up on the Google it tonight when you go home. Google it and read it. It takes 15 minutes to read it. You'll have so much fun. You'll love it. Because it's fun. It's funny, I mean, Hermes saying, saying that, I'm just a baby, all I care about is my mother's milk, I didn't steal your sheep. And Apollo laughs. So Apollo laughs. So he's also the god of the, of the, the rogues, the lovable rogue. And then Apollo picks him up out of his cradle and marches him off to uh, Zeus for judgment. And Apollo tells Zeus the story of how Hermes uh, stole a sheep. And Zeus says, this little baby stole the great Apollo sheep and up Zeus laughs. This is hysterical. This little baby pulled one over on the great Apollo. So the story, the, you know, the Homeric hymn to Hermes is a story of uh, the rising middle class and the, the craftsmen and the artisans in uh, in post-Homeric uh, Greece. In Homeric Greece and post-Homeric. And the earliest Hermes is a um, post, um, called, which is what the Greek word herma means, which is meant to ward off um, strangers. So that when strangers know, you, you would put it at the, on, on the outskirts of the city. Or you would put it in your uh, in front of your house, and it's a pic it's a post with uh, a, he a head or just sometimes a hat, and an enormous phallus yeah. out like that, yeah. great big enormous phallus. Now, of course, Lacan would say, "Oh, we 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 this is a phallus," uh, <laughs> but it's not phallic at all in that sense. What it means is, you come any closer, and you're going to feel the the might of this town or this house, so keep your distance. 
And so that's how he became the god of commerce, because people who wanted to trade, sometimes the people who come to the city or to this little village don't come to do harm, they just come to trade. So he said, okay, well, you stay there, and we'll meet you out there. And the trade takes place under the sign of Hermes, where nobody goes into the city, and they exchange their goods. And then gradually, as commerce grows, they move the, her the Herma into the Agora, and the commerce takes place in the city. And so Hermes becomes the god of commerce and, and the Agora. So he means about 20 different things. Uh, but he's a rogue, he's a trickster, he works magic, and he stands for the oppressed and the excluded and the, the lower classes. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the phenomenological meaning of the event behind the trickster. And you know, of course, the Derrida wrote a book, one of his very last books, called Rogues. And the ro word rogue very nicely links up with the Greek word demos. Plato was against demos, because I mean, Plato is the root of all evil. Plato is really all the trouble is Plato. <laughs> Plato Plato's against democracy. Why? Because it very closely, almost literally means the rule of the worst, of the demos. And the demos is not the folk. Demos is the... Was the lower class. So, tricksters, magicians, people doer, doers of wondrous works, healers are people who are trying to raise up the, 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 the least among us. And so, Yeshua is very properly called a magician in that sense. That's what I'm doing. Maybe too crazy to get out there, but. Oh, I think it's lovely. Um, but anyway, at the very <laughs> least, even if I never finish this book, because we don't know what's coming, um, go home tonight and read the Homeric Hymn to Her Hermes. You'll love it. And that's where hermeneutics comes from. And Yes. See, because he's, a th he's the god of con connections and commerce, and he's also um, the god whom Zeus... Tr a trust to send messages to, so he's an angel he's a community he's, he's the messenger of Zeus and so the thing that caught on when we use the word hermeneutics was that side of Hermes I mean it's like the New Testament there's a hundred different author the story of Hermes is written by a hundred different people at all kinds of different times with different agendas and different social settings and or, or like the Old Testament it's so it's not just one thing and but that particular function of Hermes was uh, to deliver messages for the gods because he, he dealt with others and he dealt, he was the god of commerce so he was the god of, uh, uh, of conversation and transportation and uh, that's where we get hermeneutics but it's wonderful that hermeneutics the art of interpretation is the art of a trickster right? so we have to trick out things that are and transportation being what it is I've got to transport Back to the airport, it's sort of a mundane transportation. Oh, it's for a conference. Yeah. And, uh, um, well, we didn't finish. There were still a lot of other questions. And I'm sorry. <laughs> no. It's never never ending. It is always to come. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's to come. This is the, and the uh, we thank you so much, Jack, for uh, giving of yourself and um, just being with us. Um, we join you in wanting to be um, angel tricksters. Um, yes. That's what we would like to be together. Um, and I loved what you said, too, about closure. Uh, closure is always disclosure at the same time. Um, so we're going to close the session, but it uh, opened up stuff for each of us, I hope, and, and, and perhaps even for you. So there is a, a dispensing, a disclosing of love and healing. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you for all coming. and. Thank you. Thank you for all.